To hear this and many more audiobooks in a podcast feed, please visit the first link in the description below. Thank you for your support. The Governance of China, Volume 3, by Xi Jinping, Audiobook, Part 6. Poverty Elimination and a Moderately Prosperous Society. Complete the work of building a moderately prosperous society in all respects. Part of the speech at the first plenary session of the 19th CPC Central Committee. October 25th, 2017. We must do everything possible to succeed in building a moderately prosperous society in all respects and continue to raise the level of China's socialist modernization. Now and for the near future, the highest priority of our party and country is to bring our journey towards moderate prosperity to, to a satisfactory conclusion. The 19th CPC National Congress in 2017 further reaffirmed our commitment to achieving this goal on schedule. In terms of timing, the three years remaining to us will pass in the blink of an eye, so we must act with urgency, for time waits for no one. In terms of requirements, Moderate prosperity must be genuine and not adulterated or exaggerated in any way if it is to earn the people's approval and stand the test of time. In terms of tasks, there are many difficulties we have yet to overcome in focusing on priorities, addressing inadequacies, and shoring up points of weakness. In particular, we must be resolute in forestalling and diffusing major risks, making targeted efforts against poverty, and preventing and controlling pollution. Completing such an extraordinary mission requires exceptional drive and outstanding deeds. The victory ahead calls us all to join the charge. On our journey in the new era, all party members must act in accordance with plans made at the 19th CPC National Congress regarding economic, political, cultural, social, and eco-environmental development and bring all relevant tasks to full completion. This will guarantee that we achieve moderate prosperity throughout the country on schedule an achievement which will serve as a stepping stone for us to start a new journey towards a modern socialist country. A new chapter in the fight against poverty. Part of the speech at the Seminar on Targeted Poverty Elimination. February 12, 2018. At its 18th National Congress in 2012, the CPC vowed to achieve moderate prosperity in all respects throughout the country. Accordingly, the CPC Central Committee has included development-driven poverty alleviation in the five-sphere integrated plan and the four-pronged comprehensive strategy and made it one of the key tasks for realizing the first centenary goal. We have produced a raft of major strategies for the fight against poverty on all fronts, this is a fight of unprecedented intensity, scale, and influence, but we have made decisive progress significantly improving the working and living conditions of poor areas and poor people, and in so doing we have written a new chapter in the history of the fight against poverty. First, we have set records in the history of poverty reduction in China. The rural poor population living under the current poverty line fell from 98.99 million at the end of 2012 to 30.46 million at the end of 2017, a decrease of 68.53 million and about 70%. The incidence of poverty fell from 10.2% at the end of 2012 to 3.1% at the end of 2017, a decrease of 7.1 percentage points. The average annual decrease was 13.7 million in the five years, which is more than double the annual decrease 
of $6.39 million during the seven-year priority poverty reduction program, 1994 to 2000 period. Footnote 1. The State Council launched the seven-year priority poverty reduction program in April 1994. The program set forth the goal to be achieved within the seven years up to 2000 of concentrating human material and financial resources and mobilizing all sectors of society to help 80 million impoverished rural residents meet their basic needs of life. End of footnote one. And double the annual decrease of 6.73 million during the 2001 to 2010 period when the first outline for development driven poverty reduction in rural areas was implemented. This is a departure from the old pattern that the population escaping poverty would decrease after new standards were adopted. The number of impoverished counties has dropped for the first time, with 28 emerging from poverty in 2016, and it is estimated that 2017 will see around 100 more such cases when the evaluation is complete. This shows our solid progress in addressing regional poverty. Second, we have promoted faster development in poor areas. We have strengthened poverty alleviation by developing industries and businesses that leverage local strengths, including new models of poverty alleviation such as tourism, photovoltaic technology, and e-commerce programs. This approach has strengthened poor areas' endogenous vitality and motivation for development. By promoting eco-environmental protection, relocating the impoverished population from inhospitable areas to places with better economic prospects, and returning farmland back to forest, poor areas have seen significant improvements in the environment and good results achieved in poverty alleviation through environmental protection. The development of infrastructure and public services has greatly improved basic conditions in poor and especially rural areas, breathing new life into them. By identifying those living under the poverty line, helping them escape poverty, and carrying out poverty alleviation projects, grassroots governance and management in poor areas have seen significant improvement, and rural grassroots party organizations have strengthened their cohesion and vitality. By dispatching first party secretaries and resident working teams to impoverished villages, we have trained government officials and produced competent people working in the countryside. To date, we have dispatched a total of 435,000 officials to work as the first party secretaries and 2,778,000 working team members resident in poor villages right now. The corresponding figures are 195,000 first party secretaries and 775,000 working team members. Shouldering heavy responsibilities, these officials fight side by side with their local peers in leading villagers to emerge from poverty. These officials work hard to bring happier lives to the poor, and some have even given their lives to this cause, demonstrating their strong sense of responsibility and deep love for the people. Third, we have formed a strong synergy by pooling all social forces to fight poverty. Government investment is the major input and plays a guiding role. We have strengthened collaboration between the eastern and western regions. We have reinforced the efforts of party and government institutions directed towards designated regions, buttressed the role of the military and armed police forces, and extended the participation of social forces. The state budget allocated to poverty alle alleviation grew at an average annual rate of 22.7% and provincial funds for poverty alleviation at 26.9%. Impoverished counties have integrated agricultural development funds totaling renminbi 529.6 billion for poverty alleviation. Government financial departments have arranged loans of renminbi 350 billion for relocation of the poor and granted small loans of more than renminbi 430 billion and relending loans of more than renminbi 160 billion for poverty alleviation. 
Local governments of poor areas brought in more than renminbi $46 billion by transferring surplus land quotas for urban construction. In cooperation between the eastern and western regions, 342 more developed counties in the east paired up with 570 impoverished counties in the west, contributing to poverty alleviation in western China and promoting coordinated development between regions. By providing poverty alleviation assistance to designated targets, party and government institutions, particularly central party and government departments, are able to gain a better understanding of rural and impoverished areas and improve their working practices and train their officials in the process. All sectors of society have participated widely in poverty alleviation. State-owned enterprises directly under the central government have provided targeted assistance to more than 10,000 impoverished villages in around 100 counties in former revolutionary base areas. Private enterprises have participated in the Pairing Up program to help more than 10,000 poor villages. By the end of 2017, 46,200 private enterprises had provided assistance to 51,200 villages investing renminbi $52.7 billion in poverty alleviation projects through support for local businesses and donating renminbi $10.9 billion to programs for public benefit. These endeavors have benefited more than 6.2 million registered poor. The China Glory Society organized more than 500 well-known entrepreneurs to participate in targeted poverty alleviation activities in Liangshan Prefecture, Sichuan Province. Cooperation agreements were reached on 149 projects with a contract value totaling renminbi $203.7 billion, and more than renminbi $40 million was donated for public welfare in the prefecture. These activities have not only helped impoverished villages and people to escape from poverty, but also promoted the great Chinese tradition of helping the poor and assisting those in difficulty. Not long ago, I received a letter from 20 young party members of the China Railway Tunnel Group who were working on the Chengdu Kunming Railway expansion project. They said that more than 50 years before, the fathers or grandfathers of many of them had been involved in constructing the Sha Mu La Da Tunnel, the most difficult section of the Chengdu Kunming Railway. Builders of the previous generations feared neither danger nor death and dared to break through natural barriers. With this heroic spirit, they turned natural chasms into thoroughfares and their achievements are unsurpassed in the history of railway construction anywhere in the world. Now, these young people have taken on the mantle from previous generations and accepted the mission of building the Xiaoxiang Ling Tunnel, the longest and most difficult run on the new Chengdu Kunming Railway. Determined to match their predecessors and remain true to their mission, they are working hard to complete the expansion project as quickly as possible. Once complete, the railway will become an accelerator, helping people along its route to escape poverty. Reading the letter, I am very pleased to see that the younger generations take responsibility for and are loyal to the country and the people. Fourth, we have established an institutional framework with Chinese characteristics for the fight against poverty. While strengthening CPC leadership, we have included in the framework the following systems. A responsibility system where every party fulfills their own duties and functions. A working system where targets of assistant are, assistance are accurately identified and targeted efforts are made to help them out of poverty. A policy system where policies at all levels are coordinated. An investment system to guarantee financial support and provide human resources. An assistance system where targeted measures are implemented for different regions, villages, households, and individuals. A social mobilization system to elicit extensive participation and build synergy. A multi-channel and omnidimensional oversight system and a stringent evaluation system. 
This framework provides a strong institutional guarantee to back up the fight against poverty. The most fundamental element of this framework is a working mechanism whereby the central leadership makes overall plans, provincial authorities take overall responsibility, and city and county authorities take charge of implementation. Authorities at all levels sign written pledges so that clear goals are set, accountability is ensured, and implementation measures are adopted. With these achievements, we have contributed China's vision and approaches to the global cause of poverty reduction. We have gained valuable experience in the following respects from the practice of fighting poverty. Firstly, we uphold CPC leadership to provide a strong organizational guarantee. Strong leadership is vital to the fight against poverty. We have given play to the role of party committees at all levels in exercising overall leadership and coordinating the efforts of all. In addition, we have put in place a system whereby top leaders of the government and the party at the provincial, city, county, township, and village levels take full responsibility for this work. This provides a firm political guarantee for poverty alleviation. Secondly, we uphold the strategy of targeted poverty alleviation to improve effectiveness. Targeted efforts are essential to the fight against poverty. We must take targeted measures to reduce and eradicate poverty, including identify the poor accurately, arrange targeted programs, utilize capital efficiently, take household-based measures, dispatch first-party secretaries based on village conditions, and achieve the set goals. We identify the targets of poverty alleviation, determine who will carry out the work and how they should do it, and make clear how to apply an exit mechanism for those who have emerged from poverty. We do not spray preferential policies indiscriminately or kill fleas with a hand grenade. Instead, we adopt targeted measures for different villages, households, and individuals according to their specific conditions so that we can address the root causes of poverty. Thirdly, we increase investment and strengthen financial support. Funding is a key guarantee for the fight against poverty. We have ensured multi-channel funding and diversified investment. Government funding is the main source and plays a guiding role. Input from financial institutions is increasing. The capital market's role in supporting poverty alleviation is tapped. And private funds are going into poverty alleviation on an extensive basis. Fourthly, we mobilize people from all quarters. To fight poverty, all parties should combine in a joint effort. Both the government and society play their roles to the full, with government-sponsored projects, sector-specific programs, and corporate and societal assistance supplementing each other. We have mobilized all sectors and coordinated the market and society, so a poverty alleviation framework with extensive social participation is now in place. Fifthly, we have strict requirements to encourage hard work and concrete results. This is essential to the fight against poverty. We must exercise full and rigorous party self-governance throughout the process and implement regular inspections and stringent evaluation so as to ensure that, that concrete efforts are made in poverty eradication and that the results are genuine, can prove their worth in practice, and will also withstand the test of time. Sixthly, we ensure the principal role of the people in poverty elimination and arouse their enthusiasm in fighting poverty. Impoverished people's self-motivation is the foundation of the fight against poverty. We must rely on the people. We stimulate the enthusiasm, initiative, and creativity of the poor, help them access education, and build aspirations. We must balance the relationship between external assistance and the poor's own efforts. To this end, we foster among the poor an awareness of escaping poverty through self-reliance, conduct training programs to improve their skills and abilities in work and business, and organize, guide, and support them in their efforts to escape poverty through their hard work. Through these endeavors, our fight against poverty gains traction from the motivation of the people. All of this valuable experience should be carried forward and developed further. Win the Battle Against Poverty 
part of the speech at the Seminar on Targeted Poverty Elimination, February 12, 2018. The 19th CPC National Congress in 2017 has made overall plans for the final stage of the battle against poverty, and relevant measures have been set out at the Central Conference on Economic Work, the Central Conference on Rural Work, and the National Conference on Development-Driven Poverty Alleviation. To implement these plans and measures, we should prioritize the results of poverty alleviation, focus on severely impoverished areas, and make solid progress on all fronts. First, we should strengthen organization and leadership. We must win the tough battle against poverty, as our party has made a solemn promise to the people. We must be true to our promise. Since the 18th CPC National Congress in 2012, poverty eradication is the only issue on which party and government heads at the provincial level have signed written pledges. All party and government officials, especially top leaders at every level, must enhance their political awareness and sense of responsibility and lead efforts to fulfill this mission. Here, I would like to emphasize that party committees and governments of impoverished counties assume the main responsibility in poverty elimination, and their top leaders are the first persons responsible. During the final stage of the fight against poverty, officials should remain steadfast in their posts and focus on this task. Those incapable of the task should be replaced, and those involved in fraud and falsification must be held accountable. The central departments concerned should research and formulate an action plan on poverty elimination and set a timetable and roadmap for ending extreme poverty in three years. Second, we should adhere to our goals and standards. Our goals are, firstly, we will help all rural population defined as poor by current standards to emerge from poverty, thus eradicating extreme poverty. Secondly, we will help all impoverished counties out of poverty, thus eliminating regional poverty. The poverty standards are an important gauge for deciding targets and measures and also for evaluating the results of poverty elimination. The CPC Central Committee has reiterated on many occasions that in the final stage of the fight against poverty, the standards are set to deliver the two assurances and three guarantees. Footnote 1. This refers to assurances of adequate food and clothing and guarantees of access to compulsory education, basic medical services, and safe housing for impoverished rural residents. End of footnote 1. And bring key indicators of basic public services in poor areas close to the national average. We must stick to these standards from beginning to end, and ensure sustainable results, neither lowering the bar nor setting expectations too high. Third, we should enhance relevant systems and mechanisms. We will continue the working mechanism whereby the central leadership makes overall plans, provincial authorities take overall responsibility, and city and county authorities take charge of implementation. The central leadership produces the top-level design in two respects, establishing policies and providing funds for local poverty eradication on the one hand and tightening oversight over the evaluation of results on the other. Provincial authorities make action plans in accordance with central policies and guide and supervise implementation. City and county authorities take specific measures based on local conditions to ensure that all poverty alleviation policies and plans will deliver. We will improve the mechanism for evaluating poverty alleviation results as our work progresses so that provincial authorities take the lead not only in setting requirements and taking on responsibilities, but also in performance evaluation. Third-party evaluation will be improved to narrow down the scope and simplify procedures with the focus on assessing whether the two assurances and three guarantees have been fully delivered. The provincial authorities should evaluate and review whether a county has emerged from poverty. 
Supervision and inspection teams sent by central authorities conduct spot checks to ensure the authenticity of evaluation results. The process of summoning provincial-level officials for inquiries into problems in their poverty alleviation work will be improved. We plan to hold another round this year and will make this a regular practice and talk to officials whenever problems arise. Fourth, we should take targeted measures. To win the fight against poverty, the key lies in targeted measures. To support macro decision-making and guidance, we should improve the system for registering the poor with a focus on strengthening data sharing and analysis. We should advance targeted policy implementation. We should take into consideration local conditions and apply different measures for different villages, households, and individuals. Solid work should be done to help the poor population by developing businesses, relocating them from inhospitable, inhospitable areas, creating more job opportunities, renovating, renovating dilapidated houses, improving education and health care, and developing the eco-economy. Here I would like to emphasize poverty alleviation through business development and relocation. These are the main solutions to increasing income and eliminating poverty in the long run. Now that food and clothing are secured for the poor, we should plan for the future and aim for sustainable development of agriculture. And we must not be short-sighted in pursuit of quick successes and instant benefits. The state has invested very heavily in relocation projects for the poor. We cannot relocate people indiscriminately, for example, moving households that need not move and leaving poor households where they are. In the next three years, all registered poor in need of relocation will be relocated first, and other residents in the same villages who are eligible for relocation will also be catered for. Poor people who cannot be relocated for the time being should be guaranteed basic food and clothing and proper access to compulsory education, medical care, and safe housing. Future poverty alleviation can be combined with the rural revitalization strategy to relocate the poor step by step for the purpose of protecting the eco-environment and making steady progress in poverty elimination and towards prosperity. Fifth, we should improve fund management. Often substantial in value and covering many areas and locations, poverty alleviation funds are managed over a long course, making their supervision difficult and thus attracting wide attention. We should strengthen supervision to ensure that the use of funds is transparent and clean. We should increase financial input to ensure it matches the goals of poverty elim elimination. We should integrate funds for poverty alleviation and improve the management of agricultural funds to ensure that they support the targeted programs while increasing efficiency and benefits. We will establish databases of county-level poverty alleviation programs, strengthen evaluation, and expand the reserve of potential programs, preventing funds from lying idle or being wasted. We should improve the public information system, in which the allocation and utilization of poverty alleviation funds at the provincial, city, and county levels will all be made public. Programs and their use of funds at the township and village levels will be open to public scrutiny. Those committing corruption in poverty alleviation, once identified, must be investigated and held accountable. Sixth, we should improve our conduct. The CPC Central Committee has designated 2018 a year of improving party conduct in fighting poverty. We should focus on identifying and resolving problems, particularly weaknesses in the four consciousnesses, unfulfilled responsibilities, untargeted measures, poor management, and use of funds, improper working practices, and lax performance evaluation. A long-term mechanism should be put in place to ensure that prominent problems in poverty alleviation, once reported, are thoroughly investigated. Confirmed cases of misconduct must be made public and those responsible held accountable. We must draw lessons from those cases, improve our policies and measures, and strengthen regulatory systems to close the gap between the bars of the institutional cage. Seventh, 
We should enhance the training of officials. The key to fighting poverty lies in their way of thinking, capabilities, and drive. Competent personnel are what poor areas most need. In recent years, we have selected and dispatched large numbers of officials and professionals to work in poor areas. In the long run, however, the number of people we can send is always limited. Poor areas must rely on their own officials and professionals to develop. This year, we will focus on training for poverty alleviation officials at all levels. Central authorities will organize training for leading officials at the provincial level. Provincial city and county authorities should strengthen training for officials at their own levels with different priorities and focuses. For officials at the county level and above, the focus of training should be improving their political awareness, forming a sound attitude towards performance, mastering approaches to targeted poverty elimination, and developing the ability to analyze and resolve problems for officials working at the grassroots, the focus is improving their ability to tackle practical problems. So there should be more case studies and on-the-spot training to enhance their ability in targeted poverty alleviation and eradication. We should cultivate officials to be well-versed in poverty reduction policies, capable of solving problems, and disciplined in their conduct. We should attract a broad range of professionals to join poverty alleviation and rural development, encouraging college graduates, former service people, and people working or doing business elsewhere to return to their home villages or take leadership positions or start businesses. We should take better care of grassroots officials fighting poverty and encourage them to work harder during the toughest stage towards final success by making sure that the capable are in the right positions, the hardworking are duly rewarded, and those who sacrifice themselves for the cause are remembered by all. Eighth, we should motivate the poor. Impoverished people are both recipients and implementers of poverty alleviation. We should help them access education and build aspirations. We should boost their enthusiasm and initiative and motivate and guide them to improve their lives through their own efforts so as to make the poverty eradication process an internally sustainable force. We should improve our approach to the fight against poverty by providing jobs instead of giving grants and by rewarding and subsidizing productive activities so that the poor get more involved in poverty alleviation programs. We cannot do their work for them or simply dole out money and supplies. Instead, we must encourage more pay for more work. By strengthening guidance through regular communication sessions and material rewards, we will encourage the poor to learn from and catch up with each other and motivate them to rise out of poverty as soon as possible. The role of village rules and established practices should be brought into play. We can establish poverty alleviation councils, ethics panels, and wedding and funeral councils to guide the poor in abandoning outdated customs and cultivating healthy practices through different channels. This will also ease people's financial burdens. Role models should be leading protagonists. Their stories should be spread so that the poor are motivated and feel proud of freeing themselves from poverty and earn a better living through hard work. In three years' time, when we have defeated poverty in this generation, we will have brought to an end, once and for all, the extreme poverty that has shackled the Chinese nation for millennia. This will be a source of great pride. Let us work together to achieve this goal, one of great significance to the Chinese nation and to the whole of humanity. It is my belief that as long as the whole party and the people pull together and work hard, we are sure to win this battle. Deliver the two assurances and three guarantees. Part of the speech at a seminar on pressing problems related to the two assurances and three guarantees. April 16th, 2019. It is a basic requirement and core indicator in our poverty eradication effort that by 2020, we will succeed 
in delivering the two assurances and three guarantees for imp impoverished rural residents. This is key to the success of the final stage of our fight against poverty. Generally speaking, the two assurances have been delivered, but there are still some weak aspects relating to the three guarantees. In compulsory education, over 600,000 school-aged children have dropped out of school nationwide. Rural boarding schools do not have adequate infrastructure to meet the needs of all children who remain in rural areas while their parents leave to work in cities. In medical services, some impoverished people are not covered by basic medical insurance and some cannot receive timely treatment for common and chronic diseases. Impoverished counties, townships, and villages lack adequate medical facilities, and some villages do not even have clinics or qualified doctors. In housing safety, roughly 1.6 million households fall into the four categories. Footnote 1. This refers to registered impoverished households, households entitled to subsistence allowances, severely impoverished rural residents cared for at their homes with government support, and impoverished families of individuals with disabilities. End of footnote 1. That are given priority in renovation of dilapidated houses, including about 800,000 impoverished households that have been registered. In some rural areas, safe home assessment is inaccurate or not conducted at all. Drinking water quality is still an issue. About 1.04 million impoverished people do not have access to safe drinking water and the infrastructure for over 60 million rural people needs to be improved. All these problems, if not properly solved by 2020, will chip away at the success of our poverty elimination effort. All provincial authorities and central departments must give priority to these problems, build consensus and solve them effectively. To address these pressing problems, we should adopt a working mechanism whereby the central leadership makes overall plans, provincial authorities take overall responsibility, and city and county authorities take charge of implementation. The State Council Leading Group of Poverty Alleviation and Development should strengthen coordination and supervision to adjust the overall work in a timely manner. The Ministry of Education, Ministry of Housing, and Rural Urban Development, Ministry of Water Resources, National Health Commission, and National Health Care Safety Administration, as both members of the Leading Group of Poverty Alleviation and Development and authorities responsible for addressing the three guarantees, should make sure that leading officials take charge of the overall effort and other officials are responsible for specific work to ensure the implementation of policies. They should define their criteria and supporting policies in line with respective departmental functions to guide all regions to identify and solve problems. Relevant provinces, autonomous regions, and municipalities directly under the central government, here and after provinces and equivalent administrative units, should organize grassroots agencies to examine the situation and form a clear picture before working out targeted plans and measures by coordinating all organizational resources. Cities and counties should implement these plans and measures and closely track the progress to make sure the three guarantees are provided to all households. I have emphasized repeatedly that we should maintain the current poverty eradication standard, neither raising nor lowering it. Guaranteeing access to compulsory education means ensuring that children from poor families do not drop out of school during the compulsory education period. Guaranteeing access to medical care means covering all impoverished people with medical insurance, which will make treatment of common and chronic diseases accessible and affordable for them and allow them to maintain their normal life should they suffer from a serious illness. Guaranteeing access to safe housing means moving impoverished people out of dilapidated houses. Ensuring drinking water safety means giving all rural people access to safe drinking water through a coordinated approach. This is a basic national requirement, but the situation varies from place to place. For example, in terms of housing safety, attention should be given to ventilation in South China 
while keeping warm, is essentially important in North China in terms of drinking water safety. Northern China should focus on accessibility of water, while Southwest China needs to solve the problems of water supply, storage, and quality. All regions should be flexible and take their own realities into consideration rather than imposing a uniform requirement. Various measures have been explored in solving pressing problems concerning the three guarantees, but some regions have raised the standard either consciously or unconsciously. The regions that have raised the threshold far beyond the national standard should scale it down, and those that have kept the bar by and large unchanged should continue to maintain the stability and consistency of policies." The effort to deliver the two assurances and three guarantees should be based on a clear knowledge of the actual situation and any pressing problems. But in some localities, things remain vague. This is not acceptable. The relevant authorities should help all localities to identify the problems so as to take targeted measures. They should also coordinate efforts to make statistics accurate and consistent. The authorities in charge of specific sectors should take the lead in working out plans and all provinces and equivalent administrative units should formulate specific measures, timetables, and schemes to ensure that tasks are completed as scheduled. We have adequate policies and enough funds for addressing the three guarantees, but the key is to get things done. We should work harder and direct more attention to the most prominent problems, identifying gaps and improving weaknesses one by one and from household to household. We should fully publicize our policies and standards to ensure an accurate understanding among all sectors of society and unify our thinking. End of audiobook, part six.